Uh, the woman that we're going to talk about today, she's a poet. Like I said, she's the first woman professional writer in England. And on the website below, I have links to some readings of her poems um, and to more information about her. You really should check out her poetry. It's really fantastic. So her name is Isabella Whitney, and she was from Cheshire, but she lived a lot of her time in London, and she was born sometime around 1540. She was also the sister of a Geoffrey Whitney. Geoffrey Whitney was also an author. And he wrote his most famous work in 1586. So it's actually a lot of what we know about her, we know through Jeffrey. She was pioneering, not just because she was a woman, but also because at the time, there, there were women who were doing things like Catherine Parr had done some translations. Women were allowed to translate men's work. They were also allowed to write devotional literature um, and, you know, things that were really geared towards that. But she, Isabella, wrote um, poetry that was designed to please the public. So it was secular, it was funny, it was bawdy. She wrote fun poems that were designed really to entertain. And that was just really kind of, that was pioneering. That's why she's important. Um, so this is again gonna be shorter than yesterday's because like with Catherine Fackel, there isn't a lot, Catherine Fenkel, there isn't a lot that's known about her because she wasn't actually noble. She was probably middle class. Um, in her poetry, she described herself as a kind of down on her luck servant who was out of work. Um, but again, like we talked about yesterday um, and the day before, being a servant didn't necessarily mean you were lower class. People like Bess of Hardwick would have been servants uh, early on in their lives. It was a way to start your career. So she was a servant and she described herself as being whole in body and in mind, but very weak in purse. So she was broke. She was out of work. And she spent a lot of time living in London, although she was from Cheshire. So it's possible that maybe she came to London working for a, a noble family and then she just stayed there. She also started writing because she was single and she um, didn't have anybody to take care of her. So she turned, and it's interesting because Christina Pizan as well became a writer because she needed to make some money to support her family. And I always think that's interesting because now, you know, it's people want to break into being writing or to being a writer, but um, then it was kind of this thing you needed quick money and so you become a writer. And she wrote that, had I a husband or a house and all that longs thereto, myself could frame about to rouse as other women do. But till some household cares me, tie my pen, my books and pen, I will apply. So she's basically writing because she doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have a home to take care of her. She published two anthologies of poetry. The first was a copy of a letter lately written in meter by a young gentlewoman to her unconstant lover. And that was around 1567. And then she wrote A Sweet Nosegay, 1573. They were both published in London by the printer Richard Jones. The first book or the first um, work, the copy of a letter is about love. It's four different poems that have um, that have complaints about love. The first two are a female speaker and the second two are a male and they're kind of about infidelity, warning women to resist men's flattery, basically men coming up and hitting on them in clubs and saying, yeah, you're my girl, but like actually they're just really flattering them. So uh, one is titled Admonition by the Author to All Young Gentlewomen and to All Other Maids in General to Beware of Men's Flattery. So basically don't, don't trust men. The, the copy of a letter, the first poem is a response by a young woman to, and she was a very um, spirited, feisty young woman, to a former lover. And she has learned that this former lover has married another woman. And when I saw this poem, when I was reading it, it really reminded me of, um, do you guys remember the Alanis Morissette song from like 1995, You Oughta Know? Um, I was like 19 at the time and that just rocked my world. I never knew that you could have such anger and I loved it, like so spoke to me. I remember driving my Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra 
Um, I think it was a 1986 Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra blasting that song. And I was like, yes, all the anger of all the injustice of cruel men. Ugh. So um, that's what I I like in this poem to the copy of the letter. And it's not known for sure whether her complaint about this young gentleman was a literal complaint or whether it was an imaginative kind of thing, um, a, kind of a parable. Um, the statement by the printer to the reader says that the copy is both false and also true. So who knows, right? You start getting really deep there. Um, one thing about her is that she writes very simply. She uses simple language. There's not a lot of, of um, frilly stuff. She makes it really easy for people to be able to understand her. And she has a point of view that seems realistic. So it was really amazing. People could read this and identify with her and identify with what she was saying and see themselves in her poetry. And that was really the kind of first time that people, common people, not necessarily even people in court, would have had that opportunity. And of course, at this time, by the mid-16th century, the printing press was well established in London, and pamphlets were flying off like crazy. It was becoming less and less expensive um, for people to be able to buy. Books were still super expensive, but you could buy pamphlets and flyers for relatively inexpensive, relatively cheap. And so people would, you know, buy these pamphlets that had these poems on them. And you can just imagine kind of how exciting it would have been for them to read this stuff and be like, wow, you know, she's like, she's like telling my story, right? And, um, and so she really made an impression on people with that. And so, um, yeah, so we talked about that. And in the admonition, she talks she talks about unfaithful men as if it was like this game that they played. And she goes through history and talks about betrayals of women in antiquity. And um, one of the things I read about her, she likens an unlucky woman to an unwary fish caught on a hook. So it's like just kind of a game for these men who are out trolling around the clubs, picking up women and making a game of it. Um, and she she talks about these things as if it's like fun and and just a game rather than necessarily thinking too much about it. And you kind of get the sense that she understands what's going on and she understands that it's a game and that kind of everybody's playing the game together. But she wants to make sure that young women recognize what's going on. And one of the things about her is that it's very clear that she was this kind of really free-spirited kind of person because she writes very intimately about this stuff. She's experienced it herself. And she writes really honestly about it um, in her poetry, in her verses. And she is most famous for The Will and Testament. And it's actually a, a landmark poem, um, not just for being a woman, um, but it's it's a brilliant poem that even other men who've tried to write similar things since then, you know, hers really stands above. It's basically a love letter to London. She has to leave London, and she says it's because of the trouble that she's having being down on her luck, not being able to get work. And she starts with saying, the author, though loath to leave the city, upon her friend's procurement is constrained to depart Wherefore she feigneth as she would die and maketh her will and testament as followeth. So it's this will that she leaves to London. And it's basically this love letter kind of describing what the city's like. It totally brings contemporary London to life. So she talks about the brave buildings, rare boots, shoes, and pantables, handsome men, proper girls, coggers, and some honest men. Some honest men, not a lot. Handsome men, but only some honest men. It's really vivid, and you can read this and feel as if you're just walking down the street in 16th century London and experiencing life with her. And she says, the city never yet wouldst credit give, nor help would find to ease me in distress. And yet she she forgives London, and she even makes London the sole executor of her will. And she also 
addresses London the same way one would maybe address um, a, a cruel, heartbroken person. Like, like I'm, I have to leave, but I still love you, and you've been so cruel to me and broke my heart, and you, thou never yet hadst pity, she writes. And yet she still talks about the noises and the textures and the rhythms and and just what London is like, the way you might describe, you know, your lover's eyes or lips or face or hands. And um, and so it's a really brilliant just caricature, not caricature, but just um, characterization, I guess. Um, it just really brings brings London to life. So she is important, not just because she wrote for money at a time when women did not do such things, but also because she talks so intimately about London. She talks so in such a straightforward way and with such honesty. She shows such knowledge of the city and of life and of being this free spirit. And this was not something that women were supposed to have done at that time. And she talks... She says, all, and though I nothing named have to bury me withal, consider that above the ground annoyance be I shall, and let me have a shrouding sheet to cover me from shame, and in oblivion bury me and never more me name. So she's like just saying, okay, London, I'm done with you. And so we don't really know what actually happened to her. She disappears from the record after about 1580, and there, her brother had left uh, something in his will around 1600, which could have been to her, but it seems strange that she wouldn't have continued writing. Maybe she got married and stopped, maybe, who knows, but she disappears after 1580, and it's likely that she died at that point. Um, there's a an article from The Atlantic that I have in the, in the links, and the closing paragraph of it I'm going to read because it sums her up really, really well. And it says, <clears throat> in a world that measured privilege by the power to withdraw from common public life, Whitney flaunted her immersion in the color and noise of urban commerce. In a world that measured womanhood by its powers of modulated restraint, she practiced exorbitant indecorums. She wrote in her will an oppositional portrait of the system that ruthlessly preserved disparities of privilege and well-being. She invented a public self and a mode of public speaking on the page that England would not yet see again for nearly a hundred years. To the city that rejected her, she wrote a knowing and exuberant love letter, a letter and a love that left the city considerably richer than she had found it. End quote. So... That is Isabella Whitney. She's amazing. And you can get her books. Um, I have links to her pages on the Poetry Foundation, and you can learn more about her there. Um, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of writing about her just uh, critiquing her poems and, and talking about her poetry. Uh, but there sadly isn't that much about her life that's known because uh, she wasn't a, a noble woman, so she wouldn't have appeared in the record so much. But definitely, if she speaks to you, you can buy the books and you can check her out. And like I say, I've got I've got web links here too, so check her out. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. And go ahead and say hi in the Facebook group, too, if you haven't already. And I am excited to talk to you again tomorrow. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.